Um, here we go. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 168th regular meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Uh, today, we will be hearing from Paul Chisano. Uh, Paul's talk today will be an introduction to Scala and functional programming. Paul is a senior software engineer at S&P Capital IQ and has been using Scala professionally since 2008. He's also a contributor to the open source library Scala Z and is co-writing a book with Lunar. Oh dear, Bjarnason, that is right? Okay, great. Uh, functional programming in Scala. Um, tonight, before we get going, uh, we have just the standard three requests we have here. One is please silence your cell phones. Um, the second is please do not use the coffee machines uh, or like phoning or anything. Uh, they, they make a lot of noise. And uh, the last is uh, be careful around the two tripods we're recording and broadcasting right now. So just you know, be careful not to jostle them as you go by. Um, we'd like to thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. Uh, we'd also like to thank our other sponsors, which are uh, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Nylock would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. <coughs> After the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub, and that's at 250 West 14th Street. It's just on 14th, a little east of 8th Avenue on the south side. That's the downtown side. Uh, we'll have a couple of groups heading over, so don't worry about taking down the address. Uh, we do have a reservation in the back, so as we arrive, the volume, uh, the noise level will go down. We'll be able to talk. Uh, a few quick announcements. The uh, Nylog web server is uh, ha having problems right now, as anyone might have uh, seen. We're working on repairing it. Uh, we don't have a definite ETA, but um, as soon as it's back up, you'll all know. Uh, our next workshop will be on Tuesday, May 21st. Please find Rob Menez, Rob Menez, David Bristow, or James Meldrum if you have any questions about our workshop. Uh, does anyone have additional announcements before we get going? Brian? Next month's talk is on uh, MySQL ports and alternative storage engines. We have a great speaker, uh, Ronald Bradford, who's like a MySQL ace. He's written a series of books on MySQL, so it should be a good talk. Anybody else? All right then. Um, if that's all of it, please join me in welcoming our, welcoming our speaker, Paul Cezanne. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. Can, can everybody hear me? Okay. A little bit louder. A little louder. talking about Scala, uh, Scala the language, and also sort of just functional programming in general. Um, functional programming is, you know, it's a, it's a bigger topic than you know, just any one particular language. And uh, Scala is an ex excellent uh, vehicle for functional programming, but the principles of functional programming apply, you know, almost regardless of what language you're programming, or you can, you can use them in any language. Um, so just kind of as a show of hands, like, I guess how many how many people here are like already maybe somewhat how many people have even heard of functional programming? Um, Love how it. Many, <laughs> how many people um, have programmed in Java? Uh, okay, so a lot of people. Um, what about how many people programmed in a functional language uh, like Clojure? Okay, so we have like. Uh, Okay, cool. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of get a sense for the audience here. So, I'm also, um, so okay, this is my Twitter handle, and I'm, uh, I'm actually writing a book. Uh, it's called Functional Programming in Scala. I'm, I'm really just giving a, a very brief overview of things in this talk, and the book is like way more comprehensive than, than I can be, you know, in like a one hour talk. And it, you know, goes a lot slower and it introduces things gradually. Um, so if you're interested in this, in this stuff and want to check out the book, that's the URL. And uh, yeah, all right, so let's get started. So I'm just going to just really briefly talk about what is Scala, um, you know, what is the language, what's kind of the basic idea of it. Um, 
And then I'm going to just sort of talk about how you can just use Scala as, some people say you can use it as a better job, um, in the sense that you can do the same sort of programming that you're maybe used to doing in Java or just really in general in any sort of mainstream object-oriented programming language. So you can do that in Scala really easily. Um, but sort of where I think Scala is a lot more powerful is that you can use it for functional programming. So I'm going to explain, okay, what is functional programming exactly? So there's a lot of maybe definitions floating around, but there's actually like a very simple definition of what is functional programming. So I'm going to talk about that. And then um, I'm just going to give kind of an introduction to functional programming using Scala and introducing some more features of Scala just as I go. So. Um, yeah, I'd say if anyone has questions at any time, like feel free to you know raise your hand or just pipe up, and uh, you know I'll, I'll try to just answer questions that come up. And if if I can't answer it right then, then maybe we'll circle back at the end and, and answer some more questions. And uh, yeah, so let's get going. So, what is Scala? Okay, so Scala has this. This is a screenshot from the Scala homepage. Okay, we have this awesome. Uh, Flip bar here of the space age sun rising over the earth. There, uh, it's a concise, elegant, type-safe programming language that integrates object-oriented functional features. Okay, so I guess what maybe what, what the heck does that mean? Um, well, just for some background, so Scala was um, created at a Swiss university. The initial release was let's see, late it was late 2003, early 2004. Um, it was created by this guy, Mark Mendersky, who, let me see if I... Mark Mendersky, okay. It was cre yeah, created by Mark Mendersky, <coughs> who, um, he also had some background working on generic Java, which is the effort to add generics to Java, and he worked on the Java compiler. So. Um, really familiar with, with uh, Java, the JVM, and one of the big selling points of, um, one of the big selling points of Scala is, is really that it's, it's a JVM language. It's fully interoperable with Java. It's completely seamless. Um, I'll, I'll show examples of that. And so yeah, it runs on the JVM. You can call Java code from it. And it also, I mean, in addition to being sort of a traditional object-oriented language, you can also do a lot of stuff with functional programming. Uh, so, that's kind of how I would summarize what, what Scala is. So, let's start by looking at just some really simple Scala code. So, alright, so I just want to kind of show that, so this is a very simple program, and this is, I mean the syntax is a little bit different than Java, but a lot of the kind of basic ideas are the same. So it's uh, like Java, it's a statically typed language. Um, okay, we have, let's just kind of go through this line by line. Okay, we have package declarations. The package declarations work pretty much the same as Java. Um, I mean, one thing to notice is you're not required to put semicolons after all your statements. Um, Scala will infer the semicolons for you. Uh, there's some, you know, finicky rules for when, and when that happens and when it doesn't happen, that I'm not really going to worry about. But for the most part, you don't need to worry about putting semicolons in unless you want to put multiple statements on one line. Um, so when you say object and then a name, you're basically de just declaring a um, really a, a, a namespace, which is just going to have a bunch of static or standalone functions. So these functions are not associated with any class. Um, you're not going to call them with like traditional like object-oriented dot notation. Um, these are just standalone functions, uh, you know, just like in Java Lang math or something like that. Um, okay, so blocks also curly braces, same as in Java and lots of other languages. Um, okay, so let's look at a function definition here. So this is a little bit different than Java. So, uh, function definitions start with the keyword def, uh, then the identifier name, and then a list of parameters. So Scala is a 
it's a statically typed language, so you have to, so each uh, argument to the function uh, and all of express all your expressions in your program have some type. So we need to say for each uh, argument to the function what its type is, and so we say what do we want to call the identifier, what do we want to call this parameter, and then a colon, and then what is the type. So int is the type of integer. Uh, okay, so, and then, likewise, we, to say what the return type is, we have a colon and then int. So, absolute, it's a function that takes an int and returns an int. And so after we declare the type, we say equals and then the body of the function. Um, okay, we have if statements, same as in Java. Um, you know, it's the same syntax, you need to put the condition of the if inside parentheses. But okay, one thing that's a little different is you'll notice there's no return statement here. So we're not explicitly saying, um, you know, return negative n or return n, right? We are, we're just saying n here, and the result of the function is just going to be whatever expression um, is in the body of the function. So if is an expression. So this expression will evaluate to, um, Either the, left, you know, either the true branch or the false branch. Uh, any questions about this so far? No? Yeah. Can integers have any particular size? There are 32 bit integers. Um, so, yeah, so another thing is that, so, so in Java, there's kind of this, oh, sorry, another question. It's, it's, no, I'm okay. In basic, highly advanced language. <laughs> Um, you can specify in the formal parameter list whether a formal parameter is an in parameter, an out parameter, or an out in parameter. And I know they mix up the notion of reference versus et cetera to copy. Look, n appears as a formal input parameter in that thing. So is it actually changed when you run the thing or not? No. So okay. this, unless I, there's actually not even a syntax for uh, passing in like a pointer to an int that you then modify in the body of the function. So this is just, yeah, this is an immutable reference to an integer. Um, Even though just it uses the same name as the input parameter and the output parameter is called n, that's just a coincidence and the your system just ignores that they happen to have the same name. Oh, so this isn't this isn't saying, um, like we're not doing any reassignment to n here. Right, okay. We're simply saying the absolute value of n, I understand what if n is positive, is n. Uh, what if it were an array? Yeah, if, if we passed in like a mutable data structure like an array, right. then yeah, we could mutate the data structure okay. inside the function. And no explicit syntax for distinguishing, but you can see what an array is. Uh, between what? Is there explicit syntax at the level of the formal definition of function text? Or just somehow the variable? If the variable, say n were an array. You'll probably answer this later in some of the examples I'm going to get. Surely true. Okay. okay. Thanks. But yeah, if you passed in an array, it would look different. I mean, we'll, we'll see examples of oh, 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 original sequences. You're right. Okay. Um, it is a form. Okay. Doc, so array. If you had, if you had a more complicated function with a lot of detailed logic and how do you tell what's the actual return value at the end? Uh, so it's going to be, so let's look at factorial and then let it uh, become a little more clear. So this is, this, um, this absolute value function is just a single expression. So I didn't even bother to put curly braces around it or anything, it's just the result of the function is just the result of this expression. <coughs> Um, but we can also have sort of multi-statement uh, definitions like this vectorial function here. So again, we can have you know private modifiers, usual visibility visibility modifiers as you know most other languages. Um, and this is also just showing how you can write a loop. I mean, one so one thing to note here though is that we're not having to declare what the type of ACC is, for instance. Um, so like in Java, you would have to say like in ACC equals one. 
um, Scala will just figure out that, okay, ACC is an int because you've assigned it to an integer literal. Um, this is a syntax for while loop. I mean, it's pretty much the same as any C derivative language. Um, and you can see we do sort of the normal operators times equals plus equals. And then the last, so anytime you have a curly brace uh, and a, a bunch of statements, the last expression in that block is the result of that expression. Okay. Last statement for the curly brace. Yep. Yep. Um, now if this, for instance, if this were like an if, then, you know, it would be the result of the if would be the last, would be the result of the overall block. Um, okay. And then here's this function main, and this is an example of the syntax for accepting an array. Uh, so just like in Java, the, the main function receives an array of strings. Um, it's the same in Scala. Uh, I guess so. The, sort of the one difference here is that instead of saying void, you'd say like public static void main in Java maybe. Uh, we just say that this returns a unit. So in Scala, there's not sort of this dichotomy between functions that are void and functions that are return values. So all functions return a value, um, even if that value is just a unit, which is kind of just this. Uh, I mean, there's no information inside the unit. It's that sort of just has one. You know, it can only be one thing, and there's no information in it, but it's still a value. Uh, so it's just a little bit more uniform. And um, yeah, you can see we're calling print line, oh, and typo, I forgot to change this, but let's just imagine this set factorial instead of format apps. But um, okay, so this is sort of the basic syntax of, of Scala. Um, one thing that's maybe different from Java that I didn't mention is that, so in Java there's sort of the separation. There's things that are primitives and things that are uh, sort of boxed, uh, box values or pointers to values in the heap. So in Scala, each of those, each of those concepts have the same type. We just have one integer type, int. And depending on the context of where we're using it, that will either be represented as like an actual 32-bit int just on the stack, or it will be represented as a pointer to a value on the heap. And Scala will, I mean, generally select the one that, it will try to use the one on the stack where possible. <coughs> um, so for instance, if you looked at apps in, if you looked at the class file, you would see it just took a regular primitive. But there's some cases where you need to sort of promote it to uh, a box. I can talk more about that if people want to know exactly how it works. Yes. Yes. Uh, can you go back to the factorial example? Okay. Uh, so it returns int implicitly. Oh yes. Yes. So that. So this is another thing. So we haven't said <coughs> what the return type of factorial is, right? But um, Scala knows what the input type is. Knows it's an integer, and. It knows that ACC is an integer because I declared it to be an integer or set it equal to one up here. So based on that, it can infer the, the return type of the function. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you have an if block that on one branch returns a string and the other branch returns an integer, that would actually be a type error. Yeah. So. Um, that, that isn't strictly true in some cases, but I, I'm not, I'm not, totally not going to bother again. But, but yeah, in general, both branches of the have returns. So if you have only one branch of the year, what's the statement if uh, the expression was the false? So, so like, if, for example, if you get an else Okay, so if, yeah, if you have a... So if you have a function... If you just say if, whatever, if false, if, if false you know, whatever, print line. Um, so this statement just has a return type of, of the unit. So, yeah, but if you did a basically set print line, you can file, then it would uh, 
Uh, no, nope. so this would still have a return type. <coughs> this, I mean, this is probably a bug in your program because yeah, but generally not So what is it going to actually do? Um, so if I said val x equals that, yes. but what is this x would have type in it. So if, if you don't have an else branch of an if, then it, the if doesn't, you can't really say that the if returns a value because it may or may not return a value. So, so there's another question in that. Yes. Hmm. It could be useful if there's a function that you know, allows you to check for type or type off kind of thing. Show that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. Like, so basically, you do bar equal to whatever, and then it takes, you know, shape of being an integer or something else. Uh, if you could sh like show us, maybe do a println or something of, you know, what the type is. Okay. So you're asking like, how do you tell Scala what you? Want the type to be, or if I wanted to check for the type of a particular um, variable. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so one thing I'll. So, I can, so Scala has a interactive. This is like the REPL read and print loop. Um, and yeah, I can enter expressions in here. And it's going to that. Uh, how much will that? Um, yeah, and so each expression that I type in, it's, it's printing out the result and also it's going to tell me what the type is. So if I type print line, uh, let's, let's say val x is if false. Um, okay, I need val. But yeah, it's equal to unit. Um, so unit kicks off type in front. Will like will whatever's receiving unit try to infer a type? Uh, no, it's task completion. What's that? Task completion. Task completion. I mean, uh, obviously, kind of like the same kind of instructions, right? So at the end of the completion. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, why don't I? Yeah, I guess why don't I keep going and then maybe we can maybe we can circle back. Uh, yeah, sorry, Brian. Yeah, I was just gonna suggest like just go through the presentation, but it, one of the things when people ask questions, I can't hear what the questions are. Would it be possible if you repeated the questions? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, in general, every expression in Scala is it's going to return a value, and uh, you know, including if expressions, and um, you know, we often use that when we're writing functions. Uh, you don't necessarily have a explicit return statements. We just sort of uh, the body of the function is just the expression that we want the function to be equal to. Um, okay, so, and here's an example of how we actually use the, uh, that module that we just wrote. So, you know, we have some other package here, we can import it. Um, here's just a few variations on import statements. Um, we can import just the module, sort of qualified. We can import everything in the module unqualified or we can import even specific functions. Um, okay. So, so that's kind of the basic syntax of Scala. So we can also do like ordinary object oriented programming. Um, so Scala calls interfaces traits. But, uh, so we can have a trait named, which has a single function on it. Name, which returns a string. And uh, then we can say class employee, which has an ID, a first name, last name, department, and it extends name. So you, you always extend. There's no like implements versus extends. You just everything is extends. Um, and then we can define this function name, which is first name plus 
base class. Uh, so let me kind of point out a few things. So in Scala, the the fields of the class are just going to be the arguments to the function after the name of the class. So there's no like uh, sort of copying the the fields of the constructor into the fields of the class, which is kind of tedious and well of plate. Um, these, these are going to be, all, all of these parameters are going to be accessible uh, within the body of the class for any methods that you define. So there's no explicit copy. And if you, by default, um, in just a regular class, none of these are going to be public. None of these fields, but if you want to make any of them public, you can put a val. Um, so here I made first name and last name public, and left uh, hmm. department line and ID uh, private. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. If you were to put name, the whole def name up in named, would employee because it extends named inherit that whole statement first name plus last name. You so I wouldn't be able to put first name plus last name in trait name because first name and last name would not be in scope. <coughs> oh, okay. But could you give it those? Uh, but yeah, if, if named also had to define first name and last name, then... So you could define an entire like interface? Yeah, I mean you could define yeah, 100 different functions. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. No, no problem. Exactly. We've had a lot more questions than I think we were expecting, which is great. Just <coughs> raise your hand and get called. I'm wondering if Brian and I will come over with the mic. Please just give us a moment so everyone can hear you because it's a large room. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we can keep doing questions. What if you forget to type in extends or you don't type in extends? What would happen when you try to execute the program? So if I. To type, when you forget to type in extend. Like, okay. If I, so if I forgot to type that in, yeah. and you that's fine. Extend. That's not an error. Okay. I still defined a completely legitimate employee class. Okay. Uh, it's just not, uh, it won't implement name. Okay. So it'll just be an employee, and if, there's, if I try to pass it to a function that's expecting a name, then that would be an error. Can you extend multiple traits? Just give a moment for the mic down so everyone can hear you. Can you extend multiple traits? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, so yeah, you, I didn't show that, but you could have uh, yeah six different traits extend all of them. Um, another thing you can do, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but traits can also have default implementations of any of the functions in the trait. Um, so that comes in handy a lot of times. Okay. There's another question back there. Oh, okay. Um, what do you do with the uh, overloaded uh, constructors? If you have multiple constructors? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you want to have multiple constructors, um, the syntax for it is you define a function def this inside the body of the employee, and then you have to call the other constructor, the main constructor, within that. Um, yeah, I, I can show an example of that later. Can you hand the mic over there one question? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, so trait is like an abstract class, right? This, that we should make up its own implementation. Yeah, the way, so the way it's implemented is it actually, there is, it is an interface. So it will be compiled to an interface in Java. And if you have any um, functions that are defined, basically the Scala compiler will uh, mix in or insert those default implementations when you extend the tree. So it's just sort of done at the compiler level. Right. So, so things like Overriding <coughs> as still possible. Mm -hmm. Like you can override, you, know, you can override the function. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. So you can have a default class. implementation in the trade, and then you can override it with something more specialized. So. Okay. So 
So I'm going to keep going because I, I, I really didn't want this talk to be about OO Scala. Um, <laughs> Scala, Scala is actually, it's, it's a very powerful OO language. Um, and, and a lot of people use it just for that. Uh, so yeah, not, nothing wrong with that. Um, okay, so this is just to show that the interoperability is it's completely seamless between Java and Scala. So with, from Java, I could call that same Scala constructor, that new employee. Um, one thing is that name uh, is gonna, you're gonna say open friend, close friend, so it's, it's acts like a function that takes no arguments, or a method that takes no arguments. And uh, you know, we could do the same thing from Scala, except in Scala, you don't have to put the open print, close print. So Scala has this, you know, it's called the uniform access principle, which is that clients of a, of a class really shouldn't be able to tell whether a field is derived or whether it's uh, primitive. Um, they should have the same syntax for accessing the field in both cases. Because uh, that just makes it easier to uh, you know, follow the code. You could change a field to be a derived field later without having to update all the, all the client code that uses it. Um, okay, and this is also just to show that from Scala, I can import any Java classes and use them freely. So here I just imported a array, Java Util array list, created a new one, and you know, I can add to it, do all the same stuff. Basically any Java API can call it. Uh, so yeah, Scala uses the same, it's the same calling conventions it's using the Java call stack. Uh, nothing, nothing fancy there. <coughs> so that concludes the uh, <laughs> discussion of uh, sort of the basics of Scala and sort of OO of Scala. Um, I, I'm happy to like take more questions. You know, we can talk more about stuff uh, maybe towards the end. But okay, so for the rest of this talk, I wanted to talk about uh, functional programming in Scala. So, what is functional programming? So, functional programming, it's based on this, it's, it's really a very radical idea. Um, and it's based on this idea that we should construct our programs using only pure functions. And those are functions without side effects. So what is a side effect? So, um, okay, and so here's how we, this is how we write, the, you know, in Scala, the type of a function from A to B. So a, a function from A to B, a pure function, all it is doing, it is mapping um, values of type A to that, and it's going to pr produce a value of type B. It's not gonna be doing anything off to the side in addition to that. So it's purely defining a mapping between these two things. Um, so some things that a pure function is sort of not allowed to do is mutate variables. <coughs> because mutating, uh, mutating things, that's, that's something that's happening off to the side. Um, so, okay, yeah, we can't declare x equals one and then later increment it by one. Okay, we can't modify a data structure. So we can't take in an array list and then add to the array list within the body of the function. Um, we can't set a field on, on an object. So we can't just set Bob's salary to, uh, you know, 100,000. Um, we can't throw exceptions because exceptions um, result in control jumping to a completely different part of your program potentially and it's no longer just a function that's going to return a result, it's something that is going to, you know, completely change the call stack and make your program do something else. Um, and we also, in a, in a pure function, we can't perform I.O. of any sort. Uh, we can't read a line from the console, we can't print to the screen. Okay, so at this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what the fuck? <laughs> do you write uh, useful programs that, that actually do this? Um, and that, that's why I said that this, that this premise it is, so, it is so radical. Um, and so what I've said is it's not strictly true. 
so you can so you can find ways to do all these things in functional programming, but you need to do them in a way that they are not observable to your programs. So that, that's kind of the basic idea. Is, Isn't it is, kind of like an inside-outside kind of thing? It's like whenever your side effects are in the outside world, and that's the world of iteration, and, and, and in and out, and so on and so forth. And when you're in functional, that's the inside world that's kind of like cut off from all of that. Yeah, that's, that's maybe a, a good way to say it. So yeah, you can sort of think of, um, <coughs> yeah, there's sort of the world inside your program, which is pure. You're just defining these transformations. but Part of your program, one of the things it can be doing is it can be creating a program which, um, when run, it will interact with the outside world. And but that, because you have to manage state and you have to be careful about letting the outside world. Because you have to manage state. Because you have to manage state. Um, and letting the outside world in, it has to be highly controlled, otherwise it'll spread all over your program. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what I usually say is that functional programming, it's really not a restriction on what you can express. So you can write all the same programs. It's more a restriction on how it is expressed in your programs. And it's really, I mean, another way people say it is, it's really just a question of being honest about what your, what your functions do. So if you have a function from, that takes an integer and returns an integer and launches the missiles, well, okay, you just, it's okay. If you want to launch the missiles, that's okay, but you just need to have the return type reflect the fact that missile launching may be occurring. <laughs> um, so it's really just a question of being honest about what is happening in your program and explicit. And, um, but at the same time, it, it requires being explicit about things that people aren't used to being explicit about. And um, like some, some people have sort of said that, well, is functional programming the equivalent of like trying to write an entire novel um, just without using the letter E or something like that? Um, and I think you know maybe maybe the first people who really tried um, programming in this style, you know, they they were probably you know, kind of weird people who are just really interested to see, oh, I wonder what's possible with this style, with these constraints. Um, but at this point, a lot of the techniques that have kind of been worked out, and we now sort of know, okay, we know how to write very complex programs um, in a functional style. And um, I mean, at the company where I work, s and I've been doing pure functional programming there, um, writing lots of useful software that, you know, interacts with the real world and so forth and I'm doing it in a, in a pure functional style. Um, so the benefits, so why, so why do people do this? Is it just like intellectual exercise, like people are just doing it for fun? Well, uh, no, so I think the big, big selling point is there's this huge increase in the amount of code views that you can get. And um, I'm gonna try to give a sense, a sense of that. Um, the other big thing is there's fewer bugs, because a lot of bugs are caused by um, side effects that you're sort of not aware of are, are happening. Sort of like state leak. Yeah, um, yeah, like just, if you sort of, it's actually a really interesting exercise to, every time you find a bug, like do like a bug log and just try to record, okay, what, what actually led to this bug occurring? And, I would say like 90, 80, 90 percent of the time, it's it's due to some sort of state, it's state bugs. Um, another thing is that functional code is really easy to parallelize. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that uh, today, but um, you don't have any of these stateful interactions that you have to worry about. You kind of just run two pure computations in parallel, and you know that they're not going to interact with each other. Uh, it's also very easy easy to test functional code. Uh, you just need to, you know, provide the inputs to the function, get the output, and, you know, make sure it's what you expect. And I guess the other thing, so some people say that functional code is more complex, uh, more complicated, and maybe in some ways that's true, but I would say there's, functional code is extremely transparent. When you look at a, at a pure function, 
the only thing that you really need to understand, or the only thing you need to do to understand that function is just really look at its definition. You don't need to think, oh, well, what hidden state has been sort of set up or initialized behind the scenes uh, that is going to affect what this function does. You just sort of look at, the, look at the function and look at the other functions that it calls, and you can just sort of trace through what, it, what it's going to do. Is it, would it also be fair to say that, in a sense, with functional programming, you can control time better? Could you repeat the question? I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, in a sense that, you know, with regard to state. State is, is something that happens throughout time. And a value you have recorded in would you like state. Like? Let's say you have state, and you have a value recorded in memory address x. Uh, over time, memory address x changes its state as you run the for for program forward. And in, in imperative programming, you set up breakpoints to catch what's in that location as right. you're going forward. In functional programming, it's immutable. So right. you can run the for program forwards or backwards. That state's never changing. So you have complete control over time in a way that you don't have in, in imperative programming. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, if you, exactly, I mean, any, any sort of Propagation of information is very explicit in the program. Um, yeah, variables aren't just sort of mutating and modified out from the Yeah, so that's that's one way to look at it. Um, okay, so what I wanted to sort of spend the rest of the talk going over is just really just introducing like, well, what is functional programming like? Um, what do you typically do when you're a functional programming? Um, and these. So I'm going to go through these like very sort of simple examples that I, I'm really just trying to capture sort of a little bit of the essence of what it's like to sort of think functionally. And you know, it's very hard to like come up with these like super complex compelling examples you can cover in, in a one hour period, but um, I'm, I'm just hoping that this sort of gives the gist of things. So here's a, here's a function that I wrote to sum um, sum up uh, a stream of integers. So stream is a immutable uh, lazy sequence of, of integers. Not stream. So as we inspect uh, the stream, we're going to be possibly computing the you know, remaining values. So we could actually have an infinite stream uh, that, you know, so I can actually say stream dot from. Um, this actually represents the infinite stream of integers one two three four five all the way up to infinity. But it's not actually fully computed yet. So I can say um, so I can say take you know, twenty. So I can say take 20, two lists, and I can get the first 20. But I can put anything in here. I could say 200 or you know, a million. So okay. So a stream, one way to think of it is it's a, a first class loop, you might think of it. Um, and so this is a stream of integers, and we have a, a current accumulated total. This is an example of the default argument in Scala. So I can actually call sum with either one argument, in which case uh, a, ACC will be zero, or I can call it two arguments, in which case that will be value zero. And you can see this logic is pretty simple. So if the stream is empty, then I just re return the current accumulated total. Um, otherwise, we return the, um, we're just gonna re recurse. So we're gonna say, um, okay, add to the current total, whatever the head of the list is. So head is, um, so you can see res3.head here. So if I have, one, two, three. Um, so okay, head is just the first element of the list, and tail is everything except the first element. Yes? Um, can you stream other things than ints? I'm assuming you can since oh, there's yeah. a type there, but how would you stream in a float? Uh, yeah, so I could say, would you have to give it like a step value for floats? 
Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of different functions for creating streams, but yeah, you can have a stream of anything. Uh, you can like stream of strings, ints, doubles, floats, employees, anything. And it's lazily evaluated. <laughs> and, I mean, how do you have a stream of arrays, or a stream of list, or a stream of objects, in how much that object already has a predefined. Does the object does the object need like a way to deal with the stream? Some kind of generator. Some yeah. yeah. Some you, you would have some prop. I mean, I I'm, I you probably wouldn't get the stream by like literally typing it in literal. But you'd have some process that generates arrays, and then you could create a stream from that process. Could you? I mean, can you type stream string into the REPL and what what do you even get? Like what what is a I mean I can say hi there. I think okay. he's asking about the automatic generation. Oh, how do I generate? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah for all types you're gonna have a generator. Alright, so for ints there's an automatic generator that starts at zero. Yeah, yeah so the from function that's just like a convenience one that happens to exist. Um, there's there's a, maybe later we I can show okay. but there's a whole bunch of ways you can create streams. Yeah, like a very common thing is like you have some sort of initial state and then some sort of step function that you're going to use to progressively transform that state. There's like an implicit two string that's being resolved, right? Oh, yeah. That's just in the REPL here. Um, right. Yeah, whenever I evaluate something, it's going to print out. It's going to call two string on it to, to print it out. Does it do a recursion optimization? Yes, so I was actually just going to talk about that. So this is an example. So this is a recursive definition, but um, so ordinarily, if this were just you know evaluated kind of naively, this would you know blow your job like call stack if you had a large enough um, stream of elements. But uh, since this is in tail position, so we're not doing anything after the recursive call, uh, Scala will actually compile this just to the same the same sort of code as if you wrote. Uh, to the bytecode. Okay, so this is the sum function. So, oh yeah, and then I just showed this. So one thing you notice, this happens all the time when you're programming, is you often notice duplication. So I might write the sum function, and then sometime later, um, I might write the product function. And you can see the definitions are very similar here. Okay, this is operating on doubles. Those are 64-bit, uh, you know, double precision, one point values. But, I mean, the definitions, the, the structure is very similar, except that a typo I call some again. But, okay, pretend that's product. Um, yeah, you can see we're doing the same thing. It, it's, the only difference is that the accumulated value it starts at one for product. Um, Return type should also be double. Okay, so that should be double as well. Question around the use of recursion and how recursion generates the list that, that gets returned. No, I'm saying that when you when you call sum, it was I would expect the uh, this, the XS and the ACC as part of the arguments to the function, but it was only just a list of numbers. So that means somehow ACC was. I wasn't I wasn't calling oh. sum here. I was just calling stream. So this is just some oh. convenient syntax for creating a, like a literal. Oh yeah, I saw the stream, but I didn't. I thought that like, so you, you showed how sum was called. Oh no, I, I haven't shown. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm sorry about the typos here, but okay, so sum and product very similar the structure. So 
Now, these are like very short examples, so you know it probably doesn't matter if you just re-implement these to you know both using explicit recursion. But if you want, um, we can factor out uh, factor out the common structure here. So let's think about what we have to do. Um, so we're going to need a function parameter for what to use as the sort of initial ACC, right? So we're going to need a function parameter for that. And we're also going to need a function parameter for this function. And this function, so here it's plus. It's the plus function. And it's taking two arguments, the current accumulated value and the current, uh, current value of the list. Or from the string. So we're, so we're going to actually need to parameterize our definition on a function. And this is something, so this is called a higher order function. This is something that's done all the time in function programming. So let's look at kind of how this works. So we define this function fold. So fold it still takes a string. But notice that we don't actually care what the type of the stream is anymore. Um, the only thing that we care about is that, okay, the type of the stream, A, or A is, maybe it's int, maybe it's double, has to match the type of the accumulated value, A. And the function that we're going to use to sort of combine successive elements of the stream also needs to operate on it. And you can see the structure of the code is, is almost the same as sum. X is empty. We still return ACC. So that is actually the same tack that they identical. And then otherwise, instead of calling sum, we're calling fold. And then we're just calling the function that we're passed in to update the accumulated value. And then we're just passing the function along. Okay, so does that make sense? Cool. Um, so using this, we can now define sum in terms of fold. Uh, so we say fold, x is ACC, and then we're passing it, essentially we're passing it the plus function. Um, and then we can also do the same thing for product, except we're going to pass it the multiplication. So um, it's kind of a sidebar. So what we did in this at the bottom here is we're actually this is called a function literal or an anonymous function or sometimes a lambda function. Oh, sorry, yeah. In that last one, where does what where what is y and where does it come from? So yeah, I'm I'm oh, about, about to explain. explain. Right. Okay. So uh, yeah. All right. So a lot of times when you're doing functional programming. Um, you, you have, you, you write these higher order functions a lot and you often, you don't want to always have to give them a name. Um, so I might have a plus function that happens to be laying around and then I could actually pass that to fold. But in, in a lot of cases you, you may not have a function that's named that's already lying around and you just want to quickly just inline uh, create a new function right there. And so Scala has a very convenient syntax for doing that. So here's just some examples of this. So this, um, this is a function that takes one parameter, x, and it's going to increment return x plus 1. Um, you can also annotate the type if Scala is not able to infer what the, what the type of the parameter is. You can say, OK, x is an int. Um, here's some other syntax. If I need to take two parameters, an x and a y, um, and of course, you could call these anything you want. You just comma separate them. Um, you could have a function that's a block, so you could have a whole bunch of statements in there if you wanted. Um, and then there's even some like more shorthand syntax. You can actually just say underscore, um, underscore plus underscore, and that will be a function that takes two arguments and adds them together. Um, this comes in handy for if you need to reference a method of a class and pass that as a function. Um, 
like our employee uh, class that we wrote earlier, uh, you could say underscore dot department and pass that as a function. And that's going to be a, fun a function that will pull out the department. Okay, so, uh, so one thing I notice about this, so this example, you know, hopefully that makes sense. But one thing you notice is that actually if you look at the definition, it doesn't really care that the return type is the same as the um, elements of the, of the string. So, I mean, this, this pattern here is a very general pattern. Um, and if I wanted to do this to say, count the number of employees in the sales department, um, I mean, conceptually, it's the same sort of thing in that, you know, I'd want my, my result type to be an integer to count, but my A is going to be employee. So my, I have two different types that I want to use this at. And actually, if you sort of just look at the function, it turns out it's even more general than the, the type that we gave it. Um, so we can actually generalize this a little bit further into this function fold. So now, the accumulated value can be a completely different type than the elements of the uh, of the stream, um, and the function just has to take the current accumulated value and the current value of the list and return a new accumulated value. And we can still use this exact same function for defining the sum of the product, but we can also use it for lots of other things. Um, so yeah, here's an example of using it to count up the number of employees in the sales department. Um. Um, uh, if you go back to the previous slide for a second, mm -hmm. uh, immediately oh. after... Immediately after the fold statement, you had um, the type parameters in square brackets, basically denoting the input types that yes. fold takes, right? Yes. But you only specify two of the parameters. You specified A and B, but you didn't actually specify the third argument, which is the function. Um. I guess my question is, is what would be the type of the function if you included it in the type C shirt in the brackets? So the next slide, A and B. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, That's it. No. Which one? This There's one, one that had both A and B in brackets. This, right there. This one. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So okay. fold actually takes three arguments, mm -hmm. and A and B are the types of the first two <coughs> arguments. Right. Uh, what would be if you, if you wanted to include the type of the function in the bracketed expression? What would the type of the function be? Oh, so the function. So okay. The, okay, so the square brackets Is are just type signature, right? So the square brackets, um, so after fold, <coughs> so A and B, you're just introducing type variables. They're not, um, so they're, they're type variables that you can then reference in the rest of the signature. So I'm introducing a type, uh, type variable A, a type uh, variable B. What's that? Yeah, it's it's um, they're just yeah they're they're and I can then reference those parameters elsewhere in the signature. So it's like generics. Yeah, it's generic. It's yeah, this is the syntax for generic. So like that, the stream that I get has to be of type A, and then the function, its second argument also needs to be of type A. So by referencing the same symbol. In multiple places. In the so, so it's just a collection of types you're going to use in the type signature. Yes. Can okay. you use this for any constraints on A and B? For example, the A holder method X. Yes, you can. Um, can what? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to show that question, here. Please. Oh, so the question is can we specify constraints on A, like that A is, uh, is named or something? I mean, you could just say, yeah, I guess the answer is yes, you can, you can do that. Um, I mean, you could just accept a, na uh, a name as, as the argument type. Um, you could also accept uh, an A 
that is a subtype of name. So you, you have a lot of flexibility. Yet. I guess I'm probably going to pump on that. But, yeah. you, you. On the previous slide, you had underscore Spartan. Does this this really looks awfully similar to duct typing? Does this imply that Scala supports it, or how the I mean, how does this generally work? Because you don't know the type of underscore that too. Oh, so this is so Scala will only let you use this in a context where it knows that this is an endpoint. So this isn't, um, oh. okay. yeah, this isn't like a structural or graph typing thing. It's gonna just, as long as it has a, a name, a method name that it's gonna work. Okay. All right, so let me keep going here. So, Oh, okay, so one, one thing I, I just sort of noticed about looking at this definition of counting the number of employees in the sales department is that uh, this loop here is actually really doing two things. Um, so on the one hand, we're taking each employee and we're kind of mapping it or we're converting it to either a one or a zero. And then, so that's sort of one operation. And then the other operation is, okay, now that we've converted each employee to either a one or a zero, we're then just summing up that sequence. And you might not think of it, you might not think of the problem in that way. Like most likely if you were doing this as like a while loop, you'd probably just write one big monolithic loop that kind of did everything. But um, you know, for more complex programs, it's nice to be able to assemble them, assemble your loops by sort of sticking together uh, different pieces. So if we wanted, we could actually separate, separate this out into two separate functions. So one that is going to simply just apply a function to each element of this. And then another function which is going to um, sum, sum them up, which is the one we already wrote. Um, so that, that function already exists. It's called map. And map, so here's an example of its use. So map just applies a function to each element So map applies a function to each element of a, of a sequence. So here we're just saying, you know, E is going to be of type employee. Um, we're just saying it's department of sales, map it to a one, otherwise to a zero, and then we're calling sum on that. And the nice thing about working with streams is that map is actually lazy. So map is not going to, you can call map on an infinite, infinite stream of values. And it's only going to compute the, the mapping sort of as you expect the stream. So this is sort of when you actually execute it, it's going to be roughly equivalent to if you just wrote one big one with the loop. Um, but it's going to sort of you're sort of assembling that loop from from two different uh, pieces. And um, so that sort of thing happens a lot. Just like looking at code, noticing duplication, factoring things out uh, by you know, passing in functions. And just by doing that, you discover, you know, lots of different, uh, yeah, lots of different kind of abstractions and, and useful functions that way. Um, oh, this is an example of, this is how map is actually defined on the Scala stream type. Um, so this is an example of pattern matching. So we're saying, okay, if the stream is empty, then, okay, return the empty stream. And if the stream has a head and a tail, a first element and a remaining elements, then apply the function to the head, and then map over the tail. So, um, and this op this funny operation here is the construct a new stream from a head and a tail. And so one thing that's like really interesting about this, this sort of definition is it's, it's in a way, it's sort of benevolent. Um, just by defining the signature, um, map parameters on a type B, a function from A to B, it needs to return a stream of Bs. There's really only one definition that is going to satisfy the, the type checker. Um, so for, in this case here, I have to return a stream of Bs, and H is going to be of type A. And there's really only one thing that I can do at this point, which is to apply the function that I have um, to, to use the output. 
So a lot of um, a lot of times with functional programming, you you sort of define what type you want to your function to have, and then you just sort of follow the types to the implementation. And things just sort of snap together. Um, so what? Uh, how does the pattern matching on a uh, street construction actually work? How does it work? Um, yeah. So how does, for example, the example right there with pattern match uh, H history operator T. How does H get assigned type A? Uh, so I mean, it's just part of the Scala compiler. Um, it, I mean, I guess internally it's going to be, you know, it's going to compile to like some if checks, like or if. You know, it's going to inspect the stream and then do some stuff. Um, if the stream's empty, it's going to go to that, that one branch. If the stream is not empty, it's going to then introduce into scope uh, two variables H and T, which you can then reference. So it's kind of just compiling to something that you could, in theory, write with you know, some if statements or some nested if statements. But um, it ends up being kind of a lot more declarative and you know, less finicky to Well, maybe come, come, come talk to me after. I, I could I could definitely say more about that. Um, so I have a lot more stuff. We, we've had so many questions. Um, I'm trying to decide like, I mean, which is actually really good. I'm glad people are asking questions. Um, so maybe I'll just I'll go through just one or two other things and then kind of kind of wrap up. And then But yeah, so another another example of a function that kind of comes out of, of this process of just like looking at looking at uh, looking at code, noticing duplication, packing things out. It's this function filter, which is going to um, it's going to take a function from uh, a to boolean, and it's going to remove any any elements from the strain that don't match that that function. So this is another way of writing that same uh, that same program is okay. We're calling filter and only including things that are in the sales department, and then we're calling the length function uh, on, the, on the resulting stream. And that's another way of counting uh, the number of employees in the sales department. Um, and here's here's how it's. Uh, but here, here's the definition of a very similar type of thing using pattern matching. Um, you know, we're saying, okay, if the predicate matches, then okay, include it in the output. Otherwise, don't include the first element in the output and just you know, the first one call filter. <coughs> yeah, and there's so. These functions that I just sort of introduced here, these aren't really, I mean, they definitely come up a lot and they're very handy, but they're not in any way unique. And if you sort of just sort of go through this process of, of kind of factoring code and looking for looking for these patterns, you know, you notice lots of other operations. Um, so here I just kind of made up some uh, example, sort of another like pipeline that you might write and solve. So this is doing a whole bunch of different things. Um, but you can see, you know, it's this very declarative thing. Okay, we this hypothetical, you know, we're taking stock quotes and you know trying to match buyers and sellers or something. Um, but yeah, we can sort of string these transformations together. Um, we can also zip. That's another operation of just sort of taking two streams and like pairing each element, pairing corresponding elements together for further processing. Um, and so this is just an example of the sort of thing that, that maybe comes up as you um, as you sort of build up a little library of, of uh, functions like this. Um, and yeah, if you look at um, let's see. so this is the actual Scala stream uh, 
class. And I mean, there's a ton of different functions here. And these are all, I mean, most of these, fun these functions are not, they're not really specific to any domain. They're just uh, encapsulating some pattern, a lot of them, uh, that, that comes up a lot in, in, across lots of different domains. Uh, so filter, find, uh, there's fold, fold left, fold right, you know, all these different variations. Uh, and they come in really handy in, in lots of different cases. Okay, so that is sort of, you know, I, I think that maybe gives sort of a feel for what, what it's like to uh, kind of do functional programming and, and discover and factor out these patterns. Um, I was going to go through another, another example uh, in a completely different domain of error handling, but uh, I think I'm probably going to table that. Let me suggest, if you, if you feel like you're in line, why don't you go ahead and open it under like the real time constraints? Why don't you go ahead? Uh, we'll just hold questions until later on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, Unless, of course, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I keep going. I just, you know. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. Here. So this is a completely different domain, error handling. Um, so let me just give an example here. So, so here's a. This is actually another bit of scala syntax. This is a, a map literal, so you can. There's a nice convenient syntax for creating maps in scala. Um, so this is creating a map from strings to integers. And if I have a map like this, and I look up um, some key that's not there, a D. So what should I get back? So I mean, different different languages and libraries make different decisions about what to do here. So I mean, one option is okay. I can throw an exception, key not found. That's like what Python does. Um, I could return null. That's what Java does. Uh, you know, I, undefined. Und yeah, null or undefined. So some sort of so it's value like that. Um, <coughs> but uh, kind of the problem with you know, the problem with, with uh, each of those approaches is it kind of generates, can generate a lot of boilerplate um, whenever you go to use a map. So if every time you have to look up a key in the map, you have to worry about catching an exception. Um, that can generate a lot of annoying code of, you know, if you have to look things up in two different maps, you need to look it up in one and then maybe catch the exception in the other. Same deal if you return null, you have to look look it up and then check to see if it was null. If it is, then maybe continue. Uh, so this is just sort of something that comes up a lot. And um, so the approach that we're going to use in functional programming is we're actually going to return a value to represent that can be present or absent. Um, so it's this, this type option. And it can have one of two different cases. So these are these are really just subclasses of option, or that's how they're represented in Scala. But when we say that they're a case class like this, um, Scala does a few different things for us. But so one is it it'll actually generate like hash hashing equals, so I can use them as keys and dictionaries and so forth. Um, they get a, a nice uh, two string function generated for us automatically. Uh, but that's actually not so important. What is important though is that we can now use um, use these as patterns in a pattern matching expression. And so this is what we're actually going to return when we look something up in a map. So we're not going to return null, we're not going to throw an exception, we're going to return an option, an optional result. Okay. So um, here's an example of just using, using option and just sort of using it directly. Same employee class, this time I made it a case class, so all these fields are public by default in a case class. Um, you don't have to say val in front of um, each field like in a case class. So case classes, they're also just really handy for creating you know, little uh, structs or just a container of data that you know don't you don't necessarily have any methods or functions associated with it's just something you want to build. Um, and 
So here's an example of, I have two different department maps, and I want to get Alice's salary um, by looking up in both, both maps. And, you know, whichever one uh, the employee whose name is Alice is in, I want to use that salary. Uh, so you can see this, this, is, this is the code to just sort of do that directly. And this is actually not that different than if you were to do the same thing in Java and check for null after each um, map lookup. So we say, okay, check in the first department. Okay, if it's not defined, then check the second department. And then um, once we have uh, an employee, we're going to check or an optional employee, we're gonna check, okay, is it defined? If, if no, okay, just return zero, otherwise return that employee's salary. So this is a, just another example of, okay, we've defined some data, defined a data type, we've started using it, and we're noticing, you know, some sort of boring, repetitive code that we have to write when we're working with it. Um, so if you sort of look at, Let's like look at this first block here. I mean, what do you really specify? I mean, what is ideally the information that you would like to specify? I mean, ideally, I would just like to say that I want to do a lookup in this first map, and then if that fails, look in the second map. Um, this, all this pattern matching, you know, that I have to do here, it sort of feels orthogonal to what I'm trying to do. Um, same deal here. I have an optional employee, and I either want to, if, 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 if I do have an employee, I want to pull out the salary. And then if I don't have an employee, I want to just return zero. So this is another example of like, looking at this code, you can um, sort of take the pattern that you see in this code and, and factor it into more general functions that you can reuse in other so um, that, that operation of having a computation and then uh, the returns option, and then you want to fall back to another computation that also returns option. Uh, there's a function on option called or else. So if I write If I say sum one or else sum two, it's going to return the first one because the first one is defined. But if I say uh, none or else sum two, then it's going to return the second one. And moreover, this funny arrow here is actually indicating that this argument is lazy. So this actually won't be evaluated unless the first one is, is undefined. So you can sort of do that sec second map lookup, um, and it won't actually be evaluated unless the first map, map lookup fails. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other functions on the option that you can use as well. Um, so here's an example of get or else. So this takes an option and converts it, pulls out an A um, if that A is. Uh, defined, and if not, it uses the default value that we provide. So I can say none.get or else uh, i, but I can also say sum i get or else. Uh, doesn't really matter what I put because this won't be used because the value is defined. Um, so these patterns, we can also define map, which is a flying function. To the, to the option if it's defined, uh, filter. So, and, and these are just functions that just come up um, if you just look at the use cases of options and, and how uh, you notice the patterns that are emerging. Uh, so here's like an example of that same code uh, written <coughs> now using these uh, these help functions on options. So we can say department get Alice or or else, department two get Alice. Then we can call map, pull out Alice's salary, assuming we've gotten um, an employee from one of those two departments. And then finally, 
get or else zero. Um, and this, I think, is a lot nicer. I mean, it's more declarative, and I think once you understand the meaning of these functions, it's actually uh, easier to understand what it's doing versus uh, having to go back to the explicit pattern matching, where you really have to follow every line of code to understand what it's doing. So, um, so that's just like another example of a, of a, of a domain. And what, so what's interesting is that, um, I mean, you notice like a lot, of, a lot of operations come up in different domains. So for instance, that operation map came up in this domain as well as in the domain of, of operating for sequences. Uh, same with filter. Um, and so as you sort of go through this, uh, you go through this exercise, you notice that, yeah, all these domains, which actually seem like they're very different, maybe at first, oftentimes show a lot of common structure, of common patterns. And um, you can actually even abstract over those patterns and uh, reuse code across all these different domains. So you can actually write, um, write algorithms sort of once once and for all, um, and capture these patterns once and for all, and not have to keep repeating them in all these different domains. And um, so yeah, that's, so I think that's kind of where I, I was going to stop. Um, so I'm, I'm like almost done like wrapping up and then we can do new questions. But um, yeah, so folks, so that, I hope, hoping that kind of gives a feel for what functional programming is, is sort of like. But um, yeah, I mean, functional programmers, they've been at this for a while, and they've just, through, by going through this process, have discovered a lot of different abstractions and a lot of different patterns, and you know, given them names and so forth. And um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot to it. It's like a very, it's a very deep subject, a lot of things that come up. But it's very natural um, in the sense that just sort of emerges from, you know, looking at code, factoring out patterns, and just sort of repeating that. And you end up discovering, you know, a lot of these different things. So, uh, yeah, so we can do questions. Um, yeah, it's scalaline.org, that's the homepage for, for Scala. And then um, the book, which I think does a way better job than I've done in this talk, uh, it's kind of introducing these things. Uh, functional programming in Scala, it really just starts from like, the absolute basics. Um, there's a lot of exercises to go with uh, the, the concepts so you can really like, teach yourself. Um, there's exercises, answers, hints, all that, so you can work through the book. And uh, yeah, this is the homepage if you want to check it out. And actually, so the book is not in print yet, but um, 14 and 15 chapters are already available online, and uh, you can pre-order the book and get access to those those chapters right now. So um, I wish I had like actual hard copies of the book to get out. So yeah, we can do more questions. So when you combine Scala with uh, uh, Scala with uh, you know, Java, for example, right? Um, which does no exceptions uh, in functional. How do you handle the exceptions that are stored from Java when you're calling Java library? Okay, yeah, so if you're if you're working with a Java library that throws exceptions, I mean you can catch exceptions in, in Scala. Uh, I mean I can sh show the syntax. Also you have to say try to catch uh, yeah, yeah, so I can say throw new you know. Uh, the syntax is a little different. Uh, yeah, it's basically try expression and then catch, or sorry, catch. And then you can say like case E IO exception. Oh, so you're just naming naming the, the exception. But just like you said, uh, catch IO exception B. Like, um, 
So you, you wouldn't have to uh, explicitly in your function, to, uh, in your function definition say swallows if you wanted. That oh yeah. So works. yeah, Scala doesn't have like checked exceptions. Um, you can if you're oh, interacting yeah. with like, yeah. a library that uh, yeah is expecting a function that needs to have a checked exception. You can there's a way you can say in Scala, oh, this function will throw that exception. But Scala, so unlike Java, Scala will not um, enforce, it won't force you to catch an exception. And if you don't have to catch, it will just pop up. Yeah, so, and if you don't catch it, it will get to the This seems like it's designed for parallelism. You don't want to have any state, so you don't have to uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, functional code, it, yeah, it's very easy to parallelize because, yeah, because there's no shared state that's being modified. Um, each computation is, is basically independent, and if you want to evaluate two computations that are independent, you can do so apparently. Um, so, I mean, and there's even some like fancy features, uh, uh, like, okay, if I have a, a list, I can actually create a parallel list by just saying dot par, <coughs> and then if I say map, you know, plus one, that will actually perform the mapping in parallel over each element of the list. So here it's kind of a dumb example because increment integer takes no time. But yeah, you can, so you can, I mean, this is just to show like how easy it is. And this is just one example of an API uh, for, for doing parallelization. And there's lots of other sort of APIs that you can build, but the point is that it's very easy to do. There's really no restrictions on, on, uh, on doing it because we know that there's no interaction between any of the sort of sub subtasks for each element. Two things. Uh, if you can tell us uh, how you uh, do testing and debugging any differently in a functional language. And also, I'd love to see some uh, best practices similar to uh, design patterns for functional uh, style of programming. Uh, I'd be the first to line up for your book. Great. Cool. Um, so, okay, so testing, um, I mean, you can you can do testing in pretty much the same way as, I mean, you can even use JUnit if you wanted. Um, there's a really nice library uh, called ScalaCheck, which, um, yeah, it's, there's, so there's another sort of style, oh, I'm going to connect this data. Well, um, yeah, but there's a there's a really nice style of library. This is another example of a domain where you can kind of discover these, these various patterns. But um, in the library Scala check, you would actually um, so a, a, a pure function is very easy to test. So you have some. All you really need to do is be able to generate or specify what its inputs are, and you have some. Uh, function or some property that you want to hold for the output, right? So a sort, if you wrote a sort function, you're expecting that, okay, when you give it a list, the output should be sort. And it's very easy to say, like, what it means for a list to be sorted. Fluent programming. Uh, That's what they call it in JavaScript. Oh, well. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that term, but... Uh, okay. But, yeah, so there's, there's some really nice testing libraries that you and then as far as, so for your other question, uh, design patterns, um, I would say the book does like a way better job of building up. So the, I guess the organization of the book is that it kind of starts out by just, I don't know, introducing Scala, introducing the basics, and sort of what we do is essentially discover the patterns of functional programming. Um, kind of as we go, and you end up discovering, yeah, I guess you could call it, 
I mean, some people call them design patterns. Um, I think, I, I just call them, they're just common structures or just things that recur over and over again. Mm. And um, they're, they're sort of different than the sort of OO notion of design patterns. But yeah, de definitely there are you know, very common patterns that emerge in all these different domains. And so, one or two I have a couple questions. Uh, going back to the map that you had, is the chain option supplied to the developers or is it something, it's something that you define that? Oh, that's. And so what happens if you don't define that? Yeah. You, you try to access a key from the map and, and that's not defined. Yeah, option is part of the, the Scala standard library. Okay. It's, um, yeah, it is. Uh, the second question that I have here is that um, is it possible that you could categorize all the functions or only the functions that you try to abstract all of that you could categorize? Like, for example, you know, the, the sum and the product, right? Mm -hmm. Four data into a function, so let's parameterize. As a standalone, could I parameterize the sum and the like, the past users of that one for them? Oh, I see what you're asking. Um, so you want to be able to use some for both integers and others. Yeah, so um, yeah, I guess the, the way that you would do that is um, by passing as an argument uh, a function that says how to add. So it's, you can parameterize over a type in which you know how to do addition, subtraction, multiplication. Um, and so if you actually look at, let's actually look at some here. Okay. So, okay, this signature is somewhat scary, but um, yeah, and this uses implicits, which I didn't, didn't talk about. But uh, you can sum up any uh, stream or, or list for which you have an instance of numeric, for which that thing is numeric. And it's implicit, so you don't actually need to explicitly pass that argument. Um, but you know the usual things are numeric, so integers, doubles. Um, you can also define your own numeric classes. And that will work with the you know, some syntax. Type classes? Yes, yeah, it's the same the same idea as, as type classes over here. But let's see the next one. We point zero after each of the numbers. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make sure. Questions? Yeah, we'll give away. Uh, yeah, sure. All right. So, um, at the end of every meeting, we have uh, some giveaways. So I'm sorry, we're going to wrap the questions. Anyone who wants to ask further, please, you know, Paul's going to be uh, at, the, uh, at the bar afterwards. So just come and join us. Ah, and so what we have here is we have uh, five questions. I hope you all are paying attention. Uh, five questions that Paul's going to ask. And whoever gets the right answer, for, and I'll try to be as fair as I can. And it's a big room. I'll try to get everyone. But um, there are three ebook vouchers and two copies of Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. Scala is one of the included languages. So by all means, you know, if you win, you can choose whichever one of these you prefer. So uh, go all for right. it. <laughs> so I'm uh, sorry. How many how many questions did I do here? Uh, we have five giveaways, but you can ask as many questions. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can fold over. You guys can be here for a while. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yes. No, all right. Sure. So first first question is. Uh, Scala was initially released in what year? 2002. Uh, wait, 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 Make sure you raise your hand and don't call out answers because I'm going to go for whoever raises their hand. We, I don't want anyone walking out upset about this, please. It's late 2003 and early 2004. All right, so come take your bit. Uh, next question is, who is the creator of Scala? Um, I saw him before we get this. Uh, Mark Kodersky. 
Yes. Next question, what is the basic premise of functional programming? Uh, hold on, no, no calling out, no calling out. Okay. This is lazy evaluation of answers. <laughs> function <laughs> composition. Function composition. Um, oh, I'm sorry. All right, let's, let's try again. Um, show of hands. Um, let me move it over here. Okay. Everything should be functions with no side effects. Yes. All right, there you go. Um, you have to be careful. The party lines are going to change next. <laughs> okay. Um, Everyone, Jay's having a party, so he'll tell you where it is. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. What is the name for the operation that applies a function to each element? I think you got to put that one right here. Uh, map. Yeah. Um, all right. So, okay. Next question is, uh, what is the? You know, I was gonna say it was right type, but we have like. All right. So yeah. Okay. So we'll. I'm gonna ask. What, uh, write the type of a function that accepts a string and an integer as arguments and returns an integer. Um, so if you raise your hand, you're just going to come up and, and type it in. Oh, this is, this is new. I've never done this before. Does anyone want to try this? Okay, come on, come on up. Oh, you, I'm, I, it's the first person I see. That's, that's the hard part. It's such a big room. A function that, um, Accepts a string and an integer. I'm sorry about that.